All right, good afternoon, everybody. It's two o'clock here in Hong Kong. Um, so, well, good morning or good evening, depending on, on where you are at the moment. I am very happy to, to welcome everybody to the second day of our International Graduate Studies Seminar organized by the, the Department of Early Childhood Education at the Education University of Hong Kong also the College of Education of United Arab Emirates University and the University of Helsinki in Finland. My name is Alfredo Bautista and I am Associate Professor and Associate Head of Internationalization for in, the, in our ECE department together with my colleague Dr. Sanjin, uh, who you will be meeting later today. Um, similar to our colleague, Dr. Mayra Vaxal, yesterday, I will be serving today as the moderator for today's session. All right. So, to mm, let me do this. Very good. So, to begin our day, uh, it is a pleasure for me and an honor to be uh, to introduce the head of our early childhood education department, uh, Professor Kelly Lee who will be now welcoming all of you to this second day of IGSS 2021. So, Gary, please, uh, the show is yours. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Alfredo. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the second day of the conference. Uh, my name is Kenry Lee. I'm a professor and head of the Department of Early Childhood Education here at the Education University of Hong Kong. Now, for those of you who are overseas, the Education University of Hong Kong is Hong Kong's newest university. It's publicly funded and it's dedicated to the advancements of learning and teaching. We offer a range of academic and research programs on teacher education and also complementary social sciences and humanities disciplines. Now, the Department of Early Childhood Education is the largest department in the university. We have over uh, 60 full-time staff and together with our, our part-time colleagues, lecturers, administrative and other support staff, we train around 80% of all kindergarten teachers in Hong Kong. Now, um, as, as you all know, we are living through an extraordinary time. I left Hong Kong almost 40 years ago now and came back just in time for a period of great uncertainty. Uh, there, was a, there was the social unrest of 2019. Then as we all know, uh, the pandemic struck. Now the past year has been really quite trying for, for everyone and the pandemic continued to pose great difficulties for society at large. Graduate students and junior researchers around the world are, are particularly affected uh, we have seen a great reduction in opportunities to share and uh, present work and also to, to learn from one another. So for, for this reason, when Pirio Onio from the University of Helsinki first contacted me about um, a joint seminar for graduate students, I thought it was a, a great opportunity to support our students' learning and development. Now, I even said that. Uh, what I had originally in mind was for the few of us sitting around a, a virtual sauna, if you like, having a drink and, and talking about research. Uh, little did I know that uh, it will evolve into, into such a large online event with over 200 uh, registered delegates, uh, speakers from four countries. And for all of this, I need to thank my associate heads, Alfredo Batista, Sanjin and their team. They did all the heavy lifting. I also have to thank you, our partners at the University of Helsinki and also the United Arab Emirates University, in particular, Myra, Myra Baxco uh, and her team who together made this event possible. Now, when I, when I give a welcome to, to our students, I usually tell them that Hong Kong is one of the few places in the world where competition for entry into the bachelor program in early childhood education it's very fierce. In fact, um, I think we pick one out of every 80 odd applicants. So uh, competition is almost as fierce as, as medicine and law. Uh, attitudes towards what makes for a good kindergarten teacher has, has changed a lot. 
not so long ago, uh, many would have said what's needed is just love of children. But, and then this attitude was, was reflected in, in salary. I remember maybe 30 years ago when I was still in Australia, um, kindergarten teachers were typically paid as much as sales assistants at department stores. Now, fortunately, things are changing. Uh, there is now a growing realization that though early childhood teachers serve a vital childcare function, the, the roles as educators and children's advocates are also really important. Now, this is particularly the case in, in many Asian societies where children are expected to, to go to school grade one already knowing how to read, write, and, and do sums. Now, in these societies, Hong Kong included, early childhood teachers need to ensure that children's developmental needs are also prioritized. Now, so in addition to, to liking children, what else is needed to be a good teacher? And some of the qualities include good classroom management skills, um, but pedagogical knowledge skills in numeracy, language, physical development, these are all very important areas of knowledge. And I'm very glad to hear that um, many of these topics are included in the talks today. Uh, they are, you will find them in, in the various lectures and also in the special interest groups. I hope you will find them the second day of the conference to be useful and productive. So with that, uh, I'll hand you back to, to Alfredo uh, and have a great day. Thanks, Alfredo. Back to you. Yes, yes, yes. Thanks. Thank you so much, Kerry. Well, me again. So thank you so much, uh, Professor Kerry Lee, for, for your welcoming speech and also for, for participating in today's session later on with our workshop today. All right. So um, coming back to my slides. So, um, well, now briefly, as, as our friend Myra did yesterday, so I would just like to say a few words um, as representative of the organizing committee. IGSS 2021 has been, as Gary mentioned, a collaborative effort of the three universities, um, EDU Hong Kong, United Arab Emirates University, and the University of Helsinki. So we decided to title the seminar, as you can see on the screen, Innovative Approaches in Teaching, Learning, and Research. A title that has to do with this idea that today, with the pandemic, with COVID-19, we all need to be innovative, we need to be creative to continue with our work as, as teachers, as learners, or as researchers, right? So before we begin, I would really like to say that it has been a great pleasure for, for Sanjin and I to organize this seminar with our colleagues um, from United Arab Emirates University, in special, well, Mayra Baxel, and then her team, Aisha Al Naimi, Nashla Oluasis, and also all their amazing team, IT team in, in their university, in their college, who have done an amazing job. Also, our partners with, from University of Helsinki, Professor Pirio Aunio and her research assistant, uh, Theo Mbei. Thank you so much for, for all these months of work. It has been really enriching. And of course, um, our amazing, wonderful uh, admin support here at EDU Hong Kong, um, Mr. Andy Lau and Ms. Ho Yi Miao, they have really done an amazing job supporting us for this event, right? So thanks so much, all of you, to, for your wonderful work. It has really been uh, a pleasure working with you. So let's start soon organizing the next one, all right? <laughs> Good, so let's continue, right? So this is our agenda for, for day number two, right? Um, so let me give you a really quick, quick overview of what's going to happen today, right? In just in a minute, I'm going to be introducing the speakers of our collaborative plenary session, which we entitled Meet Journal Editors and Get Your Work Published, right? So this is going to be followed by four um, 
parallel workshops, as you can see here, all of, all of them led by colleagues, faculty colleagues in our Department of Early Childhood Education. I will introduce them later. So note that there's not going to be break between the two, the two sessions, the plenary session and then the parallel workshops. So to facilitate things, what we are going to do so that you don't have to waste time finding the links to the workshops is that we will be sending you using the chat uh, uh, room, we are going to send you the Zoom links to all the four. Um, we are going to send you the links to the workshops. Um, Andy just did it, right? But we will do it again later. So, and then we are going to have a 20 minute break. And then we are going to go to the SIG sessions. The names of the different SIGs are on the screen, but later I'll mention them again. We are going to have 36 uh, presentations by graduate students or junior researchers and the rest will come tomorrow. Tomorrow is around 20. So we have today 36 present wonderful, by the way, presentations from the three universities, very professional. Um, so the, our students and graduate um, and senior researchers are going to be sharing their work. And these sessions are going to be facilitated by colleagues from our department or faculty. Um, so all of us are going to be um, mediating, facilitating the discussions to make it a little bit more productive. So as you know, the videos have been available to everybody. Everybody has been asked to think of questions or comments to, to others. So this is, this is the plan. This is what we are going to be doing during the SIG times. So thanks so much for all of our facilitators again. Uh, right, so very good timing. So this is going to be now the beginning of our, what I call collaborative keynote, right? Um, in which um, I, we are going to be, we are going to be sharing some, um, some of our experience as, um, as journal editors, right? So for this session, I am going to be the one speaking first. <laughs> Not because I like to be a protagonist, but because it makes sense in terms of the flow of the session that I would be uh, opening uh, the keynote speech of today. And then it will be my, followed by my colleagues, right? The second will be Dr. Sanjin, who is assistant professor and associate head of the ECE department as well. Um, Sanjin, is associate, Sanjin is associate editor for Early Childhood Research Quarterly and also for Frontiers in Psychology. After Sanjin, we'll have our colleagues, uh, our colleague, Dr. Wang Sen Lin, who is assistant professor in the Department of Psychology. In this case, it's a, it's a different department. Uh, Chen Lin is associate editor of the British Journal of Developmental Psychology. And after, we will have finally Dr. Derwin Chan, who is associate professor in our department in ECE and also his associate head for research. And Derwin is currently, has been currently appointed as Editor-in-Chief of Stress and Health, right? So this is going to be sort of the, the plan for our keynote, right? So what are we going to talk about? So this is kind of a very general overview of what we are going to be sharing with you today, right? So publishing is very important, right? Especially when, when you're a graduate student, when you are doing your PhD or your EDD, and it is very, very important that other than getting your degree, you gain experience in publishing your work, right? So this is why we thought that it would be a very useful thing to share with you some considerations, some tips or some strategies to increase your chances of success when you write your papers and you, when you submit your work to a journal, right? So, so basically what we would like to share with you today uh, are some, like I said, tips, strategies, prior to writing, also while you write, during your peer review process, and also after publication. So we are going to be basically drawing on our own experiences as associate editors or as editors or reviewers or authors. And we are gonna try to share with you guys, with students and junior researchers, some tips, right? Hopefully it will be helpful for you, right? So basically our idea is that each of us will be talking for around 10 to 12 minutes, right? Um, if you have comments or questions or things that you would like to share, please feel free to share them uh, using the, 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 chat, the chat box. And then we will be trying, we will try to address or respond to your comments or questions um, during the Q&A part, okay? So, so this is the plan, right? So I will start sharing first, right? 
So um, I already introduced myself. These are the journals where I have been collaborating in these past years. I finished my PhD in 2009. And right after my PhD, when I was a graduate student, actually, I was an officer for a journal. So I, very early on, I really understood how important it is to publish. And I really saw so many authors really rushing, 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 because they already had their PhD and they were really in a rush to publish. So when I was a graduate student, I realized, oh, it's very important to try to publish as soon as possible, right? So right after I finished my PhD in, like I said, in 2009, and in these past um, 12 years or something, I've been collaborating as associate editor for most of these journals. And for others, I have been in, um, involved as, an, as a member of the editorial committee. And, of, and also I have reviewed many, many for many other journals, right? So uh, again, I would like to emphasize this sort of disclaimer, what I am going to share today is really my very humble experience as, a, as an associate editor, as a as a reviewer, as an author, what I'm going to be sharing today is the, th the kinds of things that I say to my own students. So, but please keep in mind that these are just friendly recommendations, right? This is not science. M many people may or may not agree with what I'm going to say. So take all these things with, um, with, with, with these ideas in mind, right? So again, my humble suggestions, right? So uh, a few general considerations. One thing I would say, uh, having been involved with different journals in these past years, is that each journal is unique. Journals are different. Each different journal have different aims, different scope, different styles, and also different audiences, right? So it is very, very, very important that you guys, as graduate students, as junior researchers, use your time to get familiar with the differences and the similarities and differences between all of these journals, because, because they are really very, very, it may be very, very different. So one of the things you can get is, you can do in these years is getting familiar with the main journals in your field. Uh, part of the work to be done is to really as you read literature and review the literature, try to identify which are the main journals, the most important journals in your field of knowledge in, in, in your area, right? It doesn't need to be many, maybe four or five or six journals that is where people in, in your field publish their work. So it is very important that you really read what they have published in your area in those particular journals. And you try to get familiar with the similarities and differences with the kinds of papers published in those journals, right? So another thing that I think is incredibly important is to try to volunteer in these journals to serve as a peer reviewer, right? So you go to the website, enter your detail, enter your areas of expertise, and then it depends on the journal. Some journals only invite as reviewer to people who have already PhDs. Other journals are more open and give opportunities to, to, to people who are maybe doing their PhDs or their EDDs. So I think it's good that you kind of volunteer, enter your details, and some journals may contact you. When you act as a peer reviewer, the learning is actually incredible because you can put yourself in the shoes of, um, of, uh, or the, of the person reviewing, then you will also read the comments of the other reviewers, the editors. So this opportunity will give you great knowledge on the differences between the journals, the kinds of things that reviewers say, the kinds of things that editors say and how they make decisions. There we will talk a little bit more about this later. So I would recommend try to be proactive and contact journals directly, those journals in which you are particularly interested, interested in reviewing or publishing, you will get lots of reviews later on, sort of, sorry, lots of invitations to review later on. And at some point when you are so busy, you have to decline. Try to be proactive and select those journals where you want to be a reviewer and try to offer your time as a reviewer. This is a very important part of our role. Something also, another thing I would say, when we write, um, I always say this to my students, you write for a journal, right? So when you write your paper, try to write with a particular journal in mind. Like I want to send this paper to this particular journal. Of course, as I say in the slide, always try to have your plan B, C, and D in mind, because of course it may happen that you submit your paper and it's rejected. 
um, and that happened to everybody, of course. So, uh, so it's important that you write with one or several journals in mind, right? And try to adopt the style of those journals. Do not select the journal after the paper has been fully written. In my humble opinion, this is a mistake. And finally, some people may disagree with this comment, right? But I would say try to, as much as possible, refer to papers that have been previously published in those, in those journals for many reasons. One is that the authors, this, the authors of those papers are quite likely to be the reviewers of your of your own paper. So, but also most importantly, I would say, as an associate editor of a journal, when you receive other journals to review and you see that they are not even reviewing very similar things that you have published in your journal, it is really not a very good way to start. Uh, so I would recommend try to do a very thorough review of the literature, of course, a very thorough review of the literature related to your topic published in that particular journal. And as much as possible, when you submit a new paper to a journal, try if possible, right? Don't force yourself, but it's good practice to try to relate your work with the work published previously in that journal. Um, so these are some general considerations. And then I would like to finish with some um, tips, right? So I, I, I would say it is important to try to be strategic. What I mean by this is like try to consider journals that have published related work. And also uh, when you write your paper, try to make very explicit how your study contributes to the existing body of knowledge especially to the body of knowledge on that topic published already in this journal. That's number one. Number two, be realistic, right? So try to assess the quality of your own study and try to pick the right fit. Um, I had a conversation with a junior colleague, some colleague here some months ago, and I was telling her, you do not need to publish absolutely everything in tier one journals. This is my approach. Some colleagues may disagree, but sometimes it's important to be realistic and say, well, based on the quality of this particular study, I am going to submit to this other journal that is probably not the best, but it's likely that it will be published here. Another one is try to be humble, right? I think the peer reviewers are probably the best teachers when we are researchers at all the different levels, when we are junior, when we are senior, at all levels. So try to be humble and learn from your reviewers and try to use their comments to always improve your work, right? Also be persistent and resilient. And uh, this is incredibly important in research. Do not feel discouraged when you get a rejection. If you get a rejection, welcome to the club. All of us here, the sort of the more senior people here, everybody gets rejections all the time. It doesn't feel good, of course, but this is how it works. And you really learn a lot when you get a rejection. Be humble, like I said before, try to understand the comments and then try to write and rewrite your work and try to reflect using their comments. And finally, be just a learner, like I, I was just saying, right? So. We all learn by doing. The more you write and the more you submit, the more you learn. Always try to have a positive attitude. This is how this works. And we all learn from our colleagues, right? So this is my sharing, right? I hope you found it interesting. So the next person after me will be Dr. Sanjin. So Sanjin, I leave it up to you. Thank you. Hi, uh, everyone. Thank you, Alfredo, for your um, one for sharing. And uh, uh, good afternoon and good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, actually, I need to, I, I want to thank you for first of all to um, joining our Meet the Editor session. And uh, um, 
Now, Frida just talked about how we should uh, write for different journals and what kind of homework uh, we need to do before we uh, submit our manuscript to different journals. I will further share uh, my experiences of writing for publication uh, from the uh, non-native English speaking researcher and an associate editor's point of view. Uh, from the uh, registration information, I can tell that uh, many of the participants here today are either the postgraduate students or the junior researchers uh, from non-English speaking countries or regions. So I hope that my experiences will be helpful for all of you to publish uh, in English peer-reviewed journals. So uh, about me, um, as Alfredo just introduced, I'm from the uh, Department of Early Childhood Education, uh, EDHK, and uh, my research areas include early development of self-regulation and executive function, early math education, and education for disadvantaged children. I received my bachelor's and de uh, master's degree in Beijing, Beijing Normal University in China, and my uh, doctoral degree in Hong Kong. And uh, actually, I started to learn English at the age of 11 when I entered the secondary school and um, my first practice in using English in academic writing happened during my doctoral study and I only started make efforts to publish my work in English journals after I started my PhD study. So um, currently as a uh, Alfredo introduced, I'm the uh, associate editor of ESRQ and I was the associate editor of uh, AJEC for quite a few years till uh, 2019. And I'm also guest editor of Frontiers in Psychology. I have to review quite a few submissions every week, and uh, most of the submissions actually are from non-native English speaking authors. And uh, my postgraduate students are also primarily from non-English speaking regions. Therefore, I feel that um, the sharing from the perspective of non-English speaking researcher or editor might be helpful. I believe that most of us ever asked ourselves this question when we were so struggled in writing uh, as a non-English speaker, is a language a barrier? The answer for me is yes, of course, it is a big barrier. Actually, uh, the English proficiency is a big barrier, I think, in my journey of um, uh, English academic writing. I always feel that my vocabulary is limited. I, I cannot fully express myself using English. And even now, I also feel difficult to write up sentences that, that read native. However, I also want to say that um, the language is not a determinant for writing up a paper that is publishable. The editor will never accept a manuscript for publication only because of its beautiful writing. So what are the editors usually looking for in a manuscript, especially in a first submitted one? So below, I will try to give some suggestions based on my personal experiences. You may find that some of the suggestions may be more like common sense, but I found that authors often uh, neglect them, especially when we are so struggled with the language barrier. So um, the first suggestion I want to give is to forget about the language difficulties you may encounter, but only focus on the story you want to tell in the manuscript. Think of what you are taught on the academic writing classes. For example, try your best to come up with a brief but catchy title, and the title should provide a good description of the contents to be reported in your manuscript, and use the title and abstract as hooks to pull in reviewers and the editors. And um, I usually do the abstract first, and then using the chance of writing abstract to reframe the article and to help myself have a better think of the story I want to tell in the manuscript. I think the abstract is also the section in which uh, reviewers and editors get a sense of the quality of your work. So I think it is important to work hard on the abstract. And also, it is important to make sure that you have um, asked very specific and clear research questions and address each of them adequately in your manuscript. Um, you 
also need to specify how your study enhances the field and what the unique values of your study are when compared to others. There are always papers that are really well written, but they only repeated the work of others. You need to explain why such repetition is really needed. Uh, otherwise, it is usually difficult to publish pure repetitive uh, studies in high ranking journals. Therefore, the first suggestion for me is to think carefully of your study and how you are going to frame or sell your manuscript. This is not about how native your uh, English writing is, but about your understanding of your work. Um, then I want to emphasize the rigor of your study. Uh, that is, please justify and demonstrate why and how the methodology you adopted is appropriate and sufficient to address the research questions you want to answer. Uh, you need to ensure that the research tools you, you used are reliable and valid. Uh, you need to report your results clearly according to the research questions, but not try to expect the reviewers or the editors to find out the answers for you. It is also important to be aware of the limitations in your methodology and the possible consequences on the results due to these limitations. Again, when you tell the reviewers and the editors uh, how rigorous your study is, the most important thing is still your study, but not how beautifully uh, you can write, right? So um, the third thing I'm looking for uh, in a manuscript is how the authors um, interpret their findings and whether there's an in-depth discussion in the manus uh, manuscript. Um, please don't just repeat uh, or describe for a second time the findings in your discussion, but try to tell the readers what are behind your findings. It would also be helpful to provide some take-home messages in your conclusion. So um, is this determined by the language proficiency? Um, I don't think so. Um, this again relies on your understanding of the research area. After mentioning these suggestions that seem irrelevant um, to the language, I uh, would also emphasize the importance of enhancing your writing skills in preparing our work for publication. After all, we all want our work to be understood and valued. Um, the professional uh, academic writing is a language we use for communication among the scholars. Follow the writing of model papers is quite useful. Uh, you can identify several papers in top journals in your research area and try to imitate their st uh, writing style. Uh, I think you can even write down the good phrases also used in doing, for example, summary, uh, raising, uh, how, how do they raise the research questions and how they make their argumentation, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and then use uh, those phrases in your own writing. It will also be helpful to work with someone who can polish your writing after you prepare a draft. You can also establish your own review process by inviting your trustful colleagues, supervisors, and the classmates to, to read your manuscript first and give you um, their comments. Currently, in many universities, um, there's funding available for hiring professional proofreading service. Make good use of such service. But don't purely rely on the service supplier to polish your work. You should be the person to ensure the key messages are correctly conveyed in the uh, manuscript and uh, all the terminologies in your um, areas are accurately used in the uh, manuscript. As long as you work really hard on your projects and take whatever actions you can to improve your research and writing. So please just be determined, committed and confident as no one knows better about your research than other um, than you. Although um, it is totally understandable that you want to submit your manuscript as soon as possible after long writing journey, uh, journey you should always strive to submit a strong and uh, um, polished piece especially for the first submission. It won't be a perfect one and I think it needn't be a perfect piece because the review pro process is going to help you identify the areas for uh, of concern, but your article should have a uh, clear argument and uh, some comparing evidence and it should not include, for example, the typos, uh, missing citations. So please check your manuscript 
very carefully in terms of the spelling, the grammars, and the matching of the figures, the tables, and all the tests, and all the uh, references, etc. If the authors appear to be kind of sloppy with the citations, with the spelling and the grammars, and uh, um, or the authors demonstrate a lot of care with the presentation of their work, it is very likely that your manuscript will leave a negative impression to the reviewers and editors. Um, also, as suggested by Alfredo, I think it is uh, important to be prepared for revision and the resubmission, no matter I, I, I believe that all of us will feel tired uh, when we go such a long journey, but just do not give up at the prospect of writing on the manuscript some more. I always tell my postgraduate uh, students that just don't start to leave a piece of unpublished manuscript in your drawer. Um, just be more persistent in polishing your writing and don't give up. The editor will notice your efforts and all your investments uh, will get paid. So uh, to conclude, um, today, I just want to encourage all the students and the young scholars who might feel very struggled when you are trying to write up your research in English and English is not is not your native language. I just want to say, don't be scared by the language barrier. Work hard on your research design on the, on the data analysis, interpretation, presentation. The quality of your work is always the determinant of whether your work is going to be published or not. But um, at the same time, we also need to enhance our English writing skills during, during the process becoming a, a mature independent academia, right? So try to write and think in English. Reading more and writing more is always the only, top, uh, only tip for me um, to give my students to enhance their academic writing skills. Uh, after all, there's no shortcut to success and the great things never come from the um, comfortable zones. So at all you and thank you. Thank you very much. This is the end of my sharing. So I will pass the time to Jinling. Thank you, um, Sunjin. And thank you, uh, Sunjin and Alfredo for inviting me to this session. Um, I thought the um, other panelists are doing a very good job uh, giving good advices and um, sharing their experiences as associate editors. So um, I might take a little bit different approach to introduce the trends in journal publications and reporting standards. Um, I'm trying to give you as much information as I could. So um, um, the slides are pretty long, but I won't go into details um, in all of them. And I also listed the uh, websites where I drew my information and infographs from. Uh, so if you're interested in this domain, you're welcome to check that out. Um, So I'm going to talk about three areas today. Uh, the first of which is open science. The second is registered reports and reporting standards in statistics and research methodology. So about open science, um, this uh, slide, the content from this slide is from the Center for Open, open Science. Um, the traditional journals are working very well, the current system. Um, however, we do notice um, some issues um, and the whole movement of open science is to make sure that all stakeholders in the publication process are included and respected. Uh, for example, um, in open science, all scholarly content are, is preserved um, online somewhere and uh, so you are not only uh, contributing as author, contributing to contributing a manuscript, um, you also contribute to um, databases, to um, coding schemes, um, those uh, procedure um, information that will be helpful for other people uh, if they want to replicate your work. And um, institutions can evaluate researchers based on the quality of their work, but not where they publish. And founders have full insight on you know, where our money were spent. <laughs> um, some funding agencies, uh, for example, in the UK and some universities even, 
require all uh, publications um, generated from their funded projects to be published in some sort of open access channels. Um, they even sponsor this um, kind of um, publication fee uh, or um, deposit fee. Um, and uh, researchers can prioritize, you know, to get their work uh, right instead of um, get to publish in certain level of journals. Um, it also avoids the um, file drawer issue where you, if you have a um, insignificant finding, you may never publish that work, uh, although that might be um, some important uh, finding too. Um, and it also acknowledges reviewers and editors role. Um, reviewers provide feedback and they are a, um, a coherent part, very important part of the publication process. They are, um, you know, the shepherd, if you will, or the editors, um, they are the shepherds in, you know, fostering the growth of this field. So in the traditional um, publication channels, um, because of the double blind process, we don't know who the reviewers are uh, in our um, work, but some open access journals actually review the reviewer's identity after the work is accepted. So um, the reviewer's contribution is um, acknowledged this way. Um, so all in all, all stakeholders in this process um, is acknowledged and uh, um, they feel this ownership and empowerment. Types of open access. Um, there are four different types of open access. Gold open access, meaning the outputs are published in open access journals. Green um, open access, meaning the outputs are published in the journal that are also avail available in the open access repository. Uh, hybrid open access, meaning um, they can, uh, some traditional journals, um, paper-based journals uh, have the open access um, choice option uh, for um, authors. So uh, some of the uh, journals in my field like uh, child development also offer this option. You can pay an extra amount of money when your manuscript is uh, accepted to publish in the traditional channel um, to be, um, you, you pay extra uh, open access fee to be published in an open access way. Um, bronze open access is that um, um, you publish uh, a um, subscription journal that are open access without the license. license. Um, so these different types um, are all considered open access. Um, um, not only the uh, like the very um, highly visible open access journals such as Frontiers, um, um, Plus One, uh, but uh, other channels are um, part of open access movement too. So there are, is an increasing trend of um, publications on open access. Um, and uh, in terms of um, Regions, UK is um, the leading country in open access. Around half of the publications there are open access. Um, this has to do with their funding policies and their more mature uh, system from universities, from the libraries uh, to sponsor open access fees. Um, and in terms of field, um, Psychology and education are somewhere um, near here in the middle, about uh, 20 to 30 percent of publication here is psychology and here is educational science, about 20 to 30 percent uh, in these fields are open access now. Um, so here is a paper on open access. Uh, if you're interested, this is something to uh, look out for. The second um, trend, I would say, is registered reports. So traditionally, when you submit a paper to a journal, um, the editors will take a look and they will assign reviewers uh, relevant to your field to review your complete manuscript. 
But what's different in regist pre-registered report is that you have a develop, uh, you have a research idea, you have a design, then you submit the first pre-registered uh, report. So that would be the stage one of peer review. At this point, your design, your hypothesis will be reviewed by reviewers and sometimes accepted. Then your study design will um, be um, published or be available uh, in, a, in a journal's website. Um, then you go out and collect your data, analyze and write up the report. Um, then you go through the second stage of peer review. So there are two different stages of peer review in this, uh, for the same work. Um, and uh, the, 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 the benefit of doing this is to make sure that people are accurately reporting. <laughs> um, they're not um, um, doctoring their data or <laughs> uh, changing their hypothesis after they have the, their data. Oh, my original hypothesis didn't work. Let me uh, rephrase that. Um, and so it eliminates bias. Again, the, the um, draw, file drawer bias when you have a non-significant result, whether you can publish it or not. So it serves the function to increase uh, research rigor and um, it ac uh, actually uh, encourage exploratory outcomes too. Here's another um, source for um, registered report if you're interested to take a look. Um, I want to pause a little and um, give you some um, editor's insight on whether you know, open access or pre-registered reports are suitable for my study or for my area. Um, actually, editors um, have discussions on these um, new trends, um, upcoming issues on a regular basis. Um, I think the consensus is that you really need to take the um, take into consideration of the different disciplines, different nature of data, um, and um, consider this on a case-by-case -case, um, basis. For example, educational and psychology study um, sometimes take a long time for data collection. Um, so whether it is uh, realistic to make your data um, publicly, or, you know, open access to available for other people. Um, and, um, for example, qualitative studies, um, it, a lot of times it's a, a ground up approach. And um, for example, you're coding some observations. You don't have a coding scheme to start with. You have your uh, observation videos and you watch them and you come up with a coding scheme, right? Um, in that case, pre-registered reports probably is not the best option or at least at this current stage, uh, the mechanism probably does not fit your research. Um, another issue is um, sometimes pure scientific discovery um, comes as a surprise. You didn't expect to find such a finding, but suddenly um, it all makes sense um, to, to interpret the finding in certain ways. Uh, again, um, you didn't have a hypothesis to start with. So um, I'm not saying that everyone should uh, catch on with this open access and pre-register reports trend. Um, I'm saying that if you considered all uh, possibilities and all your, your area of research and the journals you publish, and if this is something that fits you, your um, area fits your background, this is something that you should consider because um, more and more journals are doing this, uh, but you don't have to if it's not suitable for you. The last bit um, I want to talk about is um, um, on reporting standards. Um, I've already used my 10 minutes, so I won't go into much detail here. Um, the um, um, standard I copied is from Child Development, is the Journal uh, of Society of Research in Child Development. They focus on three domains, rigor, reliability, and replicability. So you want to 
report as much information as you could on your sample, on your design, um, and uh, the, the, how the data were collected and coded. And you really need to be very specific in your statistical information, um, including both the um, 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 the, the, the procedures that leading up to uh, your decision, what procedures to choose, and um, the justifications for your research tools. I use this measure, why? Uh, because I have such and such evidence from the literature or from my own data. Um, so justify uh, why you used these uh, procedures, these measures. And um, more journals are focusing on what to report, um, for example, on your model, um, on um, effect size. Um, so take a close look on the journals that you're submitting um, and read their guidelines for submission on the statistics and research methods session. Follow those guidelines closely. So here are further readings on um, reporting standards, um, APA, American um, uh, Psychological Association, and AERA both have guidelines on reporting standards. Um, so uh, they, they uh, periodically review their guidelines and publish new ones. Um, the latest in APA is um, 2018. Um, check those out. So these are the web links um, from where I uh, extracted my uh, graphs and information. And thank you. I'll pass the time to Dermot. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let me share my screen. So hello, this is um, Dr. Derwin Chen. Um, so um, today I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, the uh, peer review process. I believe the uh, previous sessions we have with Dr. Uh, Bautista, Dr. Sanjin and Dr. Uh, Wang also gave us a very good uh, 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 tips of how to get better chance for your paper to be published in a better journal. So, uh, and uh, I'm going to uh, give you more tips about how uh, we uh, can do better uh, during the peer re review process. Uh, for those who already start the process of publishing, you know that uh, um, during the process, we often need to uh, uh, respond to reviewers' comments. I think this is uh, one very important part of the peer review, review process. So what are the important tips to um, give better chance for you to get uh, your paper going through this uh, process? I hope I will give you some uh, useful information on that. Okay, uh, just to uh, share with you a little bit more about myself and uh, why I can uh, give you uh, some of the uh, important tips. I'm now the Editor-in-Chief of Stress and Health, um, and I'm also an uh, editorial board member of six other journals. Uh, before I become the Editor-in-Chief, I also work as Associate Editors or Section Editors for other journals for six years. Okay. Um, so this is uh, probably the outline of my uh, very quick talk. Uh, so how uh, different roles in the editorial board involved in the peer review process. I think it's very important to understand the role before we learn about how to deal with the comments. Uh, what different decisions mean and how you can revise your paper in the revision. Okay, uh, so uh, at the editor in chief, uh, uh, we are actually do often do some initial screening and review of submissions. We assign uh, submissions to associate editors or section editors, or we can also handle submissions directly. And we often involve in making decision, final decision of the submissions. So associate editors, uh, deputy editor and section editors, uh, they work closely with uh, editor-in-chief. They 
uh, actually handle, they also handle initial screening and review of submissions. And they also help searching for uh, external reviewers who review your paper. And they often make a recommendation or sometimes even final decision of the uh, submissions. And editorial board members, they are actually the key people that our editor-in-chief and associate editor rely on uh, for uh, finding expert to review your paper. Okay? So they usually have around four manuscripts to review for a year. So just talk a little bit about uh, the peer review process in stress and health. The peer review process might vary from one journal to another, but I think the model that stress and health is doing is uh, kind of um, the typical one. Uh, we have around seven, 700 papers uh, submissions, new submissions uh, a year, uh, quite a lot. Uh, so our, our editorial officers actually screen the paper to see if actually it fulfilled the journal standard in research quality and writing before they are forward to the editor-in-chief and associate editor to actually do the initial screening and review. Um, so we test reject about 50 to 80% of the papers um, and others are sent out for external reviews. Uh, usually we have around two to four reviewers for each paper. Um, so they are actually uh, sometimes uh, when your paper are, are being externally reviewed uh, and uh, the editor-in-chief and associate editor often make uh, various decisions of your paper. Okay, reject, you know what it means, right? Uh, your paper get reject and you need to find another place for uh, publishing your work. And major revision, you're asked to respond to the comments and revise your manuscript. And same for minor revision, but the comments are a bit more minor and straightforward. Maybe you change a little bit and then you can lead to a acceptance. So acceptance, your paper means will be published in the journals. Okay, there are also other decisions like uh, reject and resubmit. So uh, it means that some of the issue are quite major, might not be addressed, but the journals also give you another chance to resubmit, okay? They are also reject and transfer to other related journals, conditional. I don't uh, go through all of this, but uh, today's talks more related to uh, revision. When you have the chance to revise your manuscript, what would you do? Okay, okay. Those are the key elements you should prepare when you uh, have the chance to resubmit your paper. Okay, you need to revise your manuscripts and you need to uh, prepare a response letter. So uh, point by point response to reviewers and editors comment. We'll talk a, lot, a little bit more about that. And sometimes we also include a cover letter that actually summarize your study and also how your revision actually respond to the issues pointed out by reviewers and editors. We also, it is optional. Yeah, some journals require, some journals uh, don't. Um, so we will talk more about this. But what are the key things? I here present you eight things that we should consider when, uh, again, I think it's mentioned also by uh, Dr. Bautista that uh, there's no hard science on that. This is just my, the, the thing that I think they work for me, it might not work for you, but uh, I, I hope uh, the information is useful, but uh, yeah, you will find out. <laughs> okay, uh, advice one, uh, reviewers and editor, they actually contribute to the peer review process actually voluntarily uh, most of the time. So uh, please respect them, thankful to them. Uh, don't be defensive. Uh, and respond to criticisms professionally. And uh, very important that uh, you make their life easier. So that's related to our advice too, okay? How to make their life easier. So uh, when in your revised manuscript, uh, you may actually uh, allow to mark the change in red color. Please don't use check chain mode because it will show your identity. So it might not work for a blind review process. And in the response letter, actually, uh, instead of writing a long paragraph of how you, uh, you, you, you may do it in your cover letter, but in your main response letter, you address the point one uh, by one, okay? Make your response letter readable in text-based format. This is the most simple format that you can copy and paste 
to the text box of the submission system. And uh, when the editor communicate your response letter, they can actually use email, make, make it easier for them, okay? If you want to use other formats like Word or PDF to respond uh, in your response, it is okay. Yeah, some journals do, can, can do that, but uh, you also often regard that as supplementary, not the main response letter. So supplementary information. And you, you should provide page and paragraph and line number of the sections that you took actions for your changes. And it is also, also easier for the uh, reviewers and editor to follow if you just copy the revised section in the response letter uh, in relation to the point you respond to the reviewers. So it makes them so easy. So they don't have to come back and forth between the response letter and the manuscript. Okay. Avoid three, uh, sometimes reviewers and editor could be wrong. They could miss something. So still be respectful and thankful to them. Respond to this criticism professionally. Try to soften your tone. Say that maybe the confusion come from my fault rather than them. So you have already clarified the issues of your manuscript. So you have ways to address the wrong thing that they say, okay? Sometimes if you uh, see some bias form that may lead to misunderstanding about the overall quality of your paper, you might have to alert the editor privately, okay? Advice four, uh, reviewers and editor could be exhausted and frustrated too. So try your best in the first revision. So it leads to a minor revision or even acceptance uh, after your first revision. So give a reasonable time for yourself and editors and reviewers, like you're very excited to receive the revision uh, decision, but uh, don't be overexcited and get a new revision on the next day because often they are very excited uh, very exhausted. They don't know oh, whether you actually put enough time and effort to your revision and pay attention to every word they say and never miss any important points. Okay, sometimes our uh, editor also point out the key thing that you should look into in the, uh, in, the, in the paper. So really pay attention to editor's points and also point by points uh, uh, answer editor's comments, okay? And Advice six, uh, sometimes these criticism and decision could be frustrating and sometimes they're not fair, but they really don't mean you're a terrible researcher. They often due to the scope and expectation and readership of the journal is different from your paper. So always be positive, never give up. So if you resubmit to another journal, just take the action of the criticism that about the quality of writing, but not change the entire scope of your paper based on um, the comments from the journal that reject you. <laughs> you know what I mean, okay. When dealing with uh, some criticism that you really cannot address because it's related to the nature of your study, study quality design, scope of your investigation and sample. So you, the only way you can deal with them is to address them as a limitation, explain how they impair the level of evidence and generalizability of your findings, suggest future direction, Read your manuscript again and make sure that you don't overstate the research question, hypothesis, and interpretation of your study. And consider changing your submission as a brief report to uh, and short comment. But if it is the case, consult the editor privately first. Okay. And finally, uh, I have to uh, uh, suggest you should also contribute to the uh, peer review process as, as reviewers. Uh, you can do that by creating your own profile in various journals, type the right keywords that represent you, get recognition at, in publons as reviewers, offer good quality of, re of reviews. Often we learn so much for being a reviewer because we take the reviewer's perspective and understand how others may view your own work, okay? It's a very good learning uh, process on being a good reviewer, okay? So pre this, uh, yeah, I think time is very limited. I think uh, I, uh, that's all I would like to share for my session about the peer review process. I hope you find it useful. So I think I just uh, stop it here and pass the time back to uh, Dr. Bautista. All right, thank you very, very much. Um, 
to all of you guys, to Sanjin, Senlin, and Derwin for your for your sharing. So it is uh, 